greetings and thank you so much for joining the Bryn Mawr Community Church family in worship today as we celebrate God's love for us as extended through Jesus Christ. We hope that your participation in this service will encourage and uplift you and will be your inspiration to follow us as we follow the path of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May God continue to bless you richly.
Good morning. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom will I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom will I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat my flesh, my enemies and my foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army should encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing I have asked from the Lord that will I seek after, for me to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to see the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. This has been your call to work. Jacksonville, Florida arranged to celebrate Lincoln's birthday in 1900. My brother J. Roseman Johnson and I decided to write a song to be sung at the exercise. I wrote the words and he wrote the music. Our New York publisher, Edward B. Marks, made mimeograph copies for us and the song was taught to and sung by a choir of 500 color school children. Shortly afterwards, my brother and I moved from Jacksonville to New York and the song passed out of our minds. But the school children of Jacksonville kept singing it. They went off to other schools and sang it. They became teachers and taught it to other children. Within 20 years, it was being sung over the South and in some other parts of the country. Today, the song popularly known as the Negro National Hymn is quite generally used. The lines of this song repay me in elation, almost of exquisite anguish, whenever I hear them sung by Negro children. Lift every voice and sing to 
till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the darkness has torn. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun, the burn you may be gone. Let us march on till victory is won. Over the course of this week, we learned that a third vaccine for the coronavirus was tentatively approved for emergency use. And we were also reminded that it has been just over a year since the first cases of the virus were officially reported and acknowledged in the United States. In that year, Worldwide, over 113 million people have been reported to have contracted the virus, and two and a half million souls have been lost to it, with the United States reporting 509,000 people gone as a result of COVID-19. Each of us, under the sound of my voice today, knows someone who has been affected in some way by this pandemic. Our lives are very different. We have come face to face with reality, the reality that indeed time is filled with swift transition. 
Consider how your life has changed and, and what this time has meant for you in terms of how you live. Are you still inclined to take things for granted, living for granted? Are you still waiting for things to return to normal? Or has it hit you that this time is our opportunity to to spend more time with God, to see life differently and perhaps focus more on what God needs us to do individually and collectively with the moments we have in this space we call life. Today I'm going to invite you to use this prayer time to look back over the past year and and to ponder what God has been saying to you individually, to your family and to those with whom you fellowship in our church community. Spend a couple of moments right now listening and asking God what God really needs you and us to do as we continue to go forward. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for this time of worship and and for the fact that we are here in this moment. As we consider the things which have taken place over the past year, we realize that it is only because of your grace, mercy, and love that we are even here. We recognize that you have us here because there is something which you have for us to do. Something in fact that only we can do. God help us to to use this time to find out what your will is, to desire that will and to continue to seek clarity about how your will can be done in and with our lives. As we pray this day, we are remembering those who were here with us a year ago and have now been called home. We think about those who have undergone many changes and challenges over the year. And we're asking you, God, to show us, to move us, and and push us to be a blessing in their lives and in the lives of all of those around us. Speak, God, to our hearts and our minds about what you want us to do as your people to make our homes and our communities, our nation and our world better. Help us, help us, help us, God, to seek your will and to do your will. In the name of Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Today I want to say to the people of America and the nations of the world that we are not about to turn around. Yes, sir. We are on the move now. Yes, sir. Yes, we are on the move and no wave of racism can stop.
Congratulations, Mr. President. So help me God. Your lesson this morning will be coming from the book of Romans, chapter 4, verses 13 through 21. It was not through the law that Abraham and his descendants received the promise that he would be the heir of the world, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law become heirs, faith would be made void and the promise nullified. Because the law produces wrath, but where there is no law, there is no sin. Therefore the promise comes through faith, so that it might be by grace, that the promise would be certain to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations before God whom he believed and who raises the dead and calls those things that do not exist as though they did. Against all hope, he believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body to be dead when he was about a hundred years old, nor yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able to perform. Amen. Today I ask your prayers as we think about hoping against hope. Our scripture lesson today comes from the writings of the Apostle Paul to the Christian churches in Rome, which struggled with how best to live out their faith. For those who had been born into the Jewish community with its faith and traditions, they were used to following the Torah, also known as the law, and the words of the prophets. This, in the context of now following Jesus Christ and the gospel, was uncomfortable. Some felt like trying to follow Christ and letting go of their old ways was a betrayal of what they had been taught over their lifetime. Paul was providing some guidance in his writing on what it meant to be transformed, to be changed by seeking the guidance of the Holy Spirit now, which was available to all believers. Paul's answer, God showed us through the example of Abraham what we cannot earn 
We can't earn favor with God through adherence to laws and regulations which failed to accomplish what God intended. Trust. Trust that God would always provide the answers. Trust. Total trust in what we recognize as the voice of God speaking to our spirits. That's called faith. Paul uses the example of Abraham and Sarah, who indeed were faithful, committed to what they believed about God, so much so that when God said that they would bear a child in spite of being beyond childbearing age and that they would be the the, the father and mother of, of nations, they believed. Our lesson says, against all hope, Abraham believed in hope. Other interpretations say that he hoped against hope, believing that if God promised that he would be the father of many nations, God would make it happen. Abraham believed because God had promised. That's faith. Recognizing that one's reality in a given moment does not necessarily reflect what God plans going forward. Believing that God can do anything God chooses to do, God promises because there is a bigger purpose to what will take place that is not just for our satisfaction in a given moment, but to provide a witness for others who may not fully understand the nature of God. God's promises provide a platform upon which we build our faith. We learn to trust God as we develop a relationship with God and come to understand that the nature of our relationship with God is ultimately dependent upon trust and hope. Faith is hoping against hope. It is confidence that that of which God speaks to us and shows us is indeed God's will for us. Faith is the result of the hope we hold in how God is leading us. That hope may seem to be impossible, unrealistic, but the trust we hold in God reminds us and encourages us to believe, to hope against hope, to hold on until God does in our lives what God has promised to do. That kind of faith aligns with the will of God. It's not self-serving and in fact serves a greater purpose, sometimes beyond what we can readily understand. When God promises something, it is clear and unmistakable. It impacts us in such a way that it will not let us go. Hoping against hope is faith because it is God's promise to us that what God is doing in this time and space is ultimately a statement of God's care and love for what God has created, which is us. For most of us, faith is a lesson not easily understood. Some think that faith is about earning God's favor and as a result of that, we get what we want. Some think that God sits high and looks low and is only concerned with judging us on how well we behave, how well we obey the commandments, or, or how well we conform to looking and acting the part of what we believe God wants. Paul explains to the churches in Rome that, this is, that it is this type of thinking which was ultimately causing the failure of God's intended community. Listen to what he says. It was not through the law that Abraham and his descendants received the promise that he would be the heir of the world, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law become heirs, faith would be made void and the promise nullified because the law produces wrath for where there is no law, there is no sin. Adherence to the law does not make people faithful. Trusting, believing in God's unconditional love, otherwise called faith, 
is the only way we can have a true relationship with God. Faith cannot be earned, bought, or traded. It comes as a result of our trusting in God, hoping against hope. And faith isn't about what we we want. God's purposes are not served by granting wishes or doing for those who perform better or can do more to impress God. If that's the case, what happens to grace? If grace has no part in our salvation, then perhaps we're on the wrong track. If if faith is only about being the best at keeping rules, looking holy and pious, pious, then there is no room for the saving grace of God because grace then plays no part in this relationship we have with God. Faith requires that we trust God and love God and that we are accepting of the will of God. The will of God is not about seeing immediate results. The promise God made to Abraham and Sarah is even being fulfilled at this moment. We're a part of that promise. God is still making good on it. God's will is not always convenient for us, but those who have held on, who have hoped against what seemed to be real, unrealistic, and yet knowing that it was the will of God, they have seen God's will done in their lifetime. God made good on the promise to Abraham and Sarah for our sake to show the world that God indeed provides hope against hope. God does what seems to be impossible time and again. Abraham and Sarah thought that they were too old to have children, that their childbearing years were gone, and yet they produced Isaac. Abraham, as a result, came to believe that God gives life to the dead. God provides hope when hope is seemingly gone. And and guess what? God didn't stop there because the world needed to understand that God does keep promises. So the promise was fulfilled through Jacob, who became Israel, through the tribes of Israel, who became a nation, and down through the generations of those faithful to God, also known as Yahweh, right on up to the one we know today as God with us, Emmanuel, who came to us to show us how God keeps promises. Through Jesus Christ, the promise continued to be fulfilled so that all nations, all nations could enjoy the promise of a relationship with God. Through that same promise and that same faith shown by Abraham, today we're heirs to what God promised. Unconditional love through grace for those who will believe in God. Today, God continues to extend the promise of unconditional love and saving grace through Jesus Christ. You have the opportunity to join with the many who follow in the footsteps of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. To join in the fellowship with those who follow Jesus Christ, who today is the way, the truth, and the life. Our hope against hope in these trying times. So, Today, we invite you to join with us as we follow the path of Christ. Amen. Let us pray. God, we thank you so much today for the testimony of those who come, have come before us, who have learned that faith is hoping against hope on what seems to be unattainable. Thank you, God, for the many witnesses to your love and grace and mercy that hope is always in order and that you always keep your promises. Help us to be faithful, continually faithful in our witness about you so that others may see your love and your beauty in the way that we live our lives. We pray this in the name of the Christ. Amen.
Thanks so much for joining Bryn Mawr Community Church's online worship service. To learn more about our ministry, visit us on the web at brynmawrfaith.org. There you can give in support of our ministry by clicking Donate to BMCC. You may also drop off or mail your generous gifts to Bryn Mawr Community Church, located at 7000 South Jeffrey Boulevard in Chicago, Illinois, 60649. If you're having difficulty leaving your home, you can make arrangements for your offering to be picked up by one of our trusted members at Bryn Mawr by dialing 773-324-2403. 